And we just want to thank you so much for joining us today for this new edition of Livestream Sunday School. We're going to get into our lesson, which is in Acts chapter 15. We're going to continue in the study of uh, the Jerusalem Council. There's a, additional communication taking place here that we're going to cover today. And there's going to be an aftermath of that that we'll be covering next week uh, that will follow this. But this is a very important section of Scripture because we're talking about the actual establishment of the church and we're talking about how Jews and Gentiles are going to be the ones that are worshiping together. Uh, this was something that was not originally, um, Jews originally didn't think that this would happen because they believed that they were the only ones who were going to have the ability to proclaim the goodness of God. But at the end of the day, it's Jews and Gentiles. That's what God had intended all along. So we're going to see that as we go through this passage and we just thank you so much again for joining us today. Let's go ahead and get started uh, with our lesson today by going into uh, prayer right now with, uh, with the Lord. Lord, we are so thankful for your presence today, and we, thankful, we are thankful, Lord, for the teaching that we will experience through the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, my, not my words, but your words. We pray that uh, what is conveyed today will be your truth and what you have to say about what's taking place here in this particular section of scripture. We thank you, Lord, for your presence and your teaching, and we ask that you bless us now, and we give you all the praise and thanks. In Jesus' precious name, amen. All right, everyone, turn your Bibles and electronic devices to Acts chapter 15. We're going to cover verses 12 through 21. It's a short section of scripture. It's not uh, a lot, but it is a continuation of Paul's ministry within the book of Acts. Remember, everything that would ha took place prior to chapter 13 involved Peter. Peter is involved uh, after the fact, but at the end of the day, it's now Paul. This is his ministry because we know that Paul was the one, along with Barnabas, who went out to the different communities and towns outside of Jerusalem and were looking to establish the church in these different areas. But he was speaking primarily to uh, Jews and Gentiles, mostly Gentiles is what we're going to refer to him as the, he is the Gentile apostle. But let's look at this passage because we are now at the place where there is a conversation taking place in Jerusalem. We're calling it the first Jerusalem council. And this is part two of that. Let's go ahead and read through the passage and we'll go back over everything and, uh, do as we normally do and just uh, kind of dive into this a little bit deeper. Starting with Acts chapter 15, verse 12, as usual, we read from the New Living Translation. Please follow along in your version. Verse 12, everyone listened quietly as Barnabas and Paul told about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. When they had finished, James stood and said, brothers, listen to me. Peter has told you about the time God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for himself. Verse 15, and this con conversion of Gentiles is exactly what the prophets predicted, as it is written. Afterward, I will return and restore the fallen house of David. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it so that the rest of humanity might seek the Lord, including the Gentiles, all those I have called to be mine, the Lord has spoken. He who made these things known so long ago. Verse 19, And so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write and tell them to abstain from eating food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. For these laws of Moses have been preached in Jewish synagogues in every city on every Sabbath for many generations. Okay, this is Acts 15, verses 12 through 21. And I want you to see how in this communication, uh, some would argue that the uh, Jews made a compromise of some sort by allowing the Gentiles to come in. No, they didn't do anything of the sort. But what they did do is that they made it very clear that uh, Jesus Christ remains the focus here. They haven't compromised anything and recognize that this was about a more of an attitude where the Jews had to essentially compromise and acknowledge that God was doing this work 
to bring the Gentiles to the church. And they were merely following what was already being told about in Scripture. And you'll notice something here when we go back to the top of the package in verse passage, excuse me, in verse 12. Everyone listened quietly as Barnabas and Paul told about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. And this was the continuation of the conversation within this council, everybody gathering together in Jerusalem, Jews hearing the truth, hearing what Barnabas and Paul had done, and the emphasis was given on what? The miraculous signs and wonders. Now, it's something you would kind of want to highlight that and recognize that these miraculous signs and wonders were being done because God was doing what? Affirming the mission of Paul and Barnabas. He was showing these things, and we only need to go back. Uh, I want you to go back to Acts chapter 14. There are numerous instances of this where it's not an accident when God is showing us that he is affirming the message that's being conveyed, this, this gospel message to the Gentiles. And he did so with what? Signs and wonders. What did Jesus do to communicate with the masses? Uh, the Spirit enabled him to do what? Perform signs and wonders and miracles. Because this gives legitimacy to the mission, the message that was taking place. Acts chapter 14, verse 27. Acts 14, verse 27. And I want you guys to look at this and see this for what it is, because this continues all the way through. There's several references to this, even in last week's lesson that we looked at. Verse 27, Acts 14. And when they arrived and gathered at the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. Opened a door of faith. All right, now let's drop, go down to Acts 15, verse 4. Acts chapter 15, verse 4. And this was at the beginning of the council. This was literally, we talked about this last week. Acts 15, verse 4. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. God had done this, these things with them. God was moving with them. God was conveying the information, the messages with the signs and wonders. They were going with them. And one more in Acts chapter 15. Go back to the top again, verse 12. Everyone listened quietly as Barnabas and Paul told about the miraculous signs and wonders that God had done through, through them among the Gentiles. And let's go. There's one I, I missed. Go back to Acts 14, verse 3. Acts 14, verse 3. I want to hammer this home, how often this is mentioned. Acts 14, verse 3. And this is when Paul and Barnabas were at Iconium. This was when they were on the way back or almost concluding their, their mission. But Acts chapter 14, verse 3. So they, being Paul and Barnabas, remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Now, understand something. When we look at something like this, we see this activity. God is moving with them, but it doesn't mean everybody's on the same page with it. But for those who are, want, who are curious, in the same way that Cornelius was ready for, to hear the message from Peter about the goodness of God, of God through Jesus Christ. He was ready to accept that, but not everybody was, but that's not the point of this. The point of this is that God knows exactly who his elect are going to be, who those people are with the hearts that are ready to receive him. And I want you to go to one more place real quick. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. So we're going to go up further past 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, 
And then one more to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And there's a way for us to describe this behavior when we get done with this passage. Hebrews 2, verses 1 through 4. And this is the message that is conveyed for anyone who is even slightly curious about the Lord or needs wants to do something. We need to pay close attention. <laughs> it says it right here. Therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. I don't think you can see a much, much clearer statement than this. Whenever God wants to have a group of people come together and know him, God shows up. He's there. He's there with us. When we're witnessing to people who we know who are ready to hear about the truth and the gospel of Jesus Christ, he shows up. He is there with us. And we need to recognize that that is exactly what God always does. This is not just a one-time event. Now, he doesn't automatically give us signs and wonders, but that's not really as important as it is for us to what? Convey the word. Is He's telling us in this passage to pay attention to what's being said. You already know the evidence of what God has done based upon Scripture and what Scripture has said. We already know his capabilities. God has the capabilities to get this done. So that's really what this section is about when we talk about how Barnabas and Paul are talking about these signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. The Gentiles. Now, as is typical in, in some instances, we have people who... Remember, what was be taking place here? The Judaizers who were sitting in the background were arguing about what the Gentiles needed to do. They need to do this and this and this in order for them to be accepted within our group. And we, we call them people who can be coexist with us. So we're still talking about this thing about differences between race and differences between people. But after Paul and Barnabas spoke, everyone got quiet. Now, it doesn't really say that here in this passage, but that's pretty much what happened. But now, let's go to verse 13. When they had finished, James stood and said, Brothers, listen to me. Now, I want you to see something that's really important here. Paul and Barnabas talked about these signs and wonders. They talked about the physical things that were taking place. We can't use that as any kind of a reasoning, but we can. what we can do is go to the Word of God. And that's exactly what James is doing here. He's going to go to the Word of God. That is what we do, and that is what we always should be doing when it comes to proclaiming the truth of the gospel message, going to God's Word. Verse 13, when they had finished, James stood and said, Brothers, listen to me. Verse 14, Peter has told you about this time that God first visited the Gentiles to take from, themself, take from them a people for himself. And, and this conversation of Gentiles is exactly what the prophets predicted. He's going to the word. Now, who is James? Well, James is the brother of Jesus. We know there's different references to James. You know, earlier in Acts chapter, uh, I believe it's Acts chapter 12, verse 2, it's mentioned very quickly that James, who's the brother of John, was killed by the sword. So it's not, obviously, it's not the same James. And we're still kind of going chronologically here. But this is James, who is the brother of Jesus, who in his own right was very prominent. He actually had some um, leverage because of who, where he came from. He is in the family of Jesus. 
half-brother, but still in the family. And he essentially would become the leader of the church in Jerusalem, where they were speaking. So he had a leadership capability here. And he's going to go right to the Word of God. And of course, he also is the writer of the book of James. But I want you to see what he says here. Look at verse 16. Back to Acts 15, verse 16. Afterward, I will return and restore the fallen house of David. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it so that the rest of humanity might seek the Lord, including the Gentiles. All those I have called to be mine. The Lord has spoken. He who made these things known so long ago. Where was he quoting from? Go to Amos chapter 9. I'll give you some time to get there. Amos chapter 9. And just for the sake of uh, conversation, Amos comes uh, after Daniel, Hosea, Joel, and then Amos in the Old Testament. If you've gone to Obadiah, then you've gone too far. Amos chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. Now, the New Living Translation does a really good job of being very clear about what is being said. And I want you to understand that this is really important for us to always remember when you're looking at Scripture, make sure that you're picking a, a Bible that gives you clarity. Uh, it, you know, you can, you can have a King James if you want, but I highly recommend a newer translation because we know that some of the newer translations have fixed some of the issues that have happened with King James. And it gives greater clarity in what's being read and, and spoken about. Amos chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. This is exactly what James was referring to in this passage in Acts chapter 15. I'm going to read Amos 9, verses 11 and 12. In that day I will restore the fallen house of David, I will repair its damaged walls. From the ruins, I will rebuild it and restore its former glory. And Israel will possess what is left of Edom and all the nations I have called to be mine. The Lord has spoken and he will do these things. All the nations refers to everybody outside of Israel. Everybody outside of Jerusalem, Israel, all the nations refers to the Gentiles. God has made it very clear, even in this prophetic message written from Amos, the prophet, about the importance of us seeing that it was God's intent all along that not just Jews, but Gentiles would be brought into his family, calling them to his to be calling them his to be of his own his own possession. And, of course, we know that the tabernacle of David has fallen. It was destroyed. There was nothing there left. There was nothing there about it. Um, there was um, no one around from the line of David except Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one who is in the line of David. He was the one that's going to, he is the one who's going to restore his kingdom. And we know that this is relative to what? Jesus returning. Well, what's going to happen when Jesus returns? We're talking about the return of Jesus. We're talking about the millennium, the millennial presence of Jesus Christ. And in the millennial presence of Jesus Christ, there will be a new temple that has been, is being built. We know that because if you're reading in Ezekiel right now, you'll see the prophetic message that Ezekiel says about the rebuilding of the temple. And that temple is there to remind us, frankly, of the original law of Moses that reminds us that we need a Savior because we sin. The fact that we're talking about a temple being revived in the millennium, in the thousand-year reign of Christ, it's a reminder that we still have to do what? Acknowledge our sin and go before the Lord and ask him to 
cleanse us from this sin. Now, we know that Christ has taken care of that on the cross for us today. But we need to see the importance of this temple of worship. The temple is showing us that we still sin. And we still are subject to punishment related, related to that sin. And Ezekiel's prophetic message about this temple was to remind the people of the Jerusalem at that time they were evil, they weren't acting right. And by giving all of these dimensions of the temple that he did, when he measured the temple and was going by the measurements and the glory of the Lord returned to the temple, remember when the glory of the Lord left the temple? The glory of the Lord is going to return to the temple. Well, that's going to be when during the millennium when the temple is rebuilt. And it was to remind the people at the time that Ezekiel was speaking to how much they were sinful. They didn't follow the practices that were taking place. They weren't obedient to the Lord. They were doing whatever they wanted to do. And this temple was a reminder and is a reminder that Jesus will return. Jesus is coming back. He is going to be there. And at the end of the day, there's still work to be done that the Lord is doing in this world today. Amen. He is still trying to reach those individuals who need to hear about his truth. And that's our responsibility to make sure that we're doing that as well, too. That we're actively praying for people. That we're actively seeking the Lord. I'll, I'll just say this, and this is, this is just a statement. My lovely bride and I, we, we, I'm, I'm going to give a hat tip to my dad here who's on the line here because we, we have devotions every Saturday now because my dad, when we went on vacation, they had devotions on Saturday. I said, oh, that's kind of cool. I think I need to do that too. And so we've been doing that. We've been making it a point to do that. It's on our calendar. We, we do devotions every Saturday sitting together. And every night we pray together. Every night we pray together before bed. Now, I'm only telling you this because, you know, this needs to be a regular practice for everybody. Prayer should be a regular practice. And I know some of you have lives where you can't help but just fall on your knees and pray uh, to the Lord and ask for intervention of something or get something needs to be taken care of. But prayer needs to be a regular part of your life. And these men that we read about in Acts, these men were all men of prayer. They went to the Lord in prayer. They weren't just automatically doing stuff saying, well, God's going to show up. No, they need, you need to pray before you do anything like that. You need to pray for the presence of the Spirit in anything. We pray on a regular basis to do what? Bless our food for the provision. Not because you're starving to death and you want to eat. Don't be like, don't be like the uh, Esau who, you know, as soon as he saw some food, oh, I'm just gonna. I am so famished. I'm gonna sell my birthright. That's not why we we do what we do. We pray before we go to bed at night prayerfully. We pray in the morning when we get up and say, "Thank you, Lord." Well, here's another day. Another day is a gift. But James is telling the people there present, he's quoting from Amos chapter 9. And Amos was speaking about what? The, re, the restoration of the temple, the restoration of the people. You know, when we die... Absent with the body, present with the Lord. But guess what? When the Lord returns to earth, guess who's going to be there with him on earth during the thousand-year reign? You and me, if we know Jesus. So I guess we're going to be moving again. You know, and, you know, it's one of those things where we live here, but we're going to be moving again. We're going to be moving from heaven, and now we're going to be moving down to Jerusalem. <laughs> the new Jerusalem. I say that because I hate moving, but that's... That this, this moving is a little bit different we're talking about here, right? Okay. 
Well, I beat that to death. So let's, let's keep, keep moving forward. So we're going to recognize here, it's important for us to recognize that I'm making the point here for you to understand that Paul and Barnabas, rightfully so, were telling the Jerusalem council, look at all the things that God has done for us in our ministry. Look at all the signs and wonders. And well, we know we can't rely on signs and wonders. But we can't rely on the word of God. And that's what James is saying here in this section. He's going to the word of God. And we need to recognize that the God's word is the test that we always want to pass with. There are people who are going to read scripture and they're going to interpret it sometimes in their own way, but at the end of the day, it's got to be correct. It's got to be correct. And we need to make sure that it's correct. And we need to make sure, too, to promote the greatest understanding that we are in God's word every single day. Reading scripture every day. I'll, I'll readily tell you, there are times I read scripture, I didn't understand it, what I was reading. This was a while ago. You know, I've been a believer since I was 26 years old. And, and I didn't always understand everything. But as you, as th you go through time, you keep reading and you keep, keep allowing the Spirit to speak to you about what you're reading, and you're going to get much more out of it, and it's going to stick with you. We need to follow truth. It's important for us to recognize that sometimes we do come up with things that are not exactly correct, and we need to make sure that we are seeking the Lord for truth. We need to read it. We need to study it. We need to be in it. We need to memorize it. Meditate on it. The whole purpose of our getting people involved with our 15-minute devotional programs is emphasizing that for 15 minutes a day, you're going to read some scripture, but you're going to pray and meditate over it. That block of time. Meditate over what you've read. We pray for discernment. Who, doesn't, who wants discernment? Who wants to be able to know what God is saying or being able to anticipate what's coming at you? Discernment, we pray for discernment, but it's important for us to be in the Word to be able to understand what God is doing. Pray for discernment. Some people have the gift of discernment. Some people have to pray hard for discernment. <laughs> that's okay that's all right but that's what you really want to do and why is that important today because we have a world that we are in right now that doesn't want to hear anything about jesus or doesn't really care about god we know this Now, I want, you to, I want to cover something that's very important here in this passage. I don't want to miss this because it really is important to cover here. And I believe James is speaking through the Spirit because there are some things that the biggest divide that Jews and Gentiles had. Well, these Gentiles were raucous. They did whatever they wanted to do. This is a generalization, right? You know, we, we generalize on every now and then. We generalize about people who didn't grow up like we did, did different things. We would generalize and say, oh, they were just raucous. They didn't care about anything. They didn't care about what Jesus was doing. And that's what some of these Jews were fighting about more than anything else, these Judaizers. Well, if you're circumcised, and that means you really have made a commitment to the Lord. But we're not requiring circumcision because that's not what God is requiring in this instance. So I want you to see some things here. I read, I think I stopped at verse 18. Pick up at verse 19. And so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Why? Because of what he just said coming from Amos. God intends for all nations to be under his, in his, under his umbrella. He wants all nations to respond to him. But look at what he says in verse 20. This is really, really cool here because he's establishing something that the Gentiles do need to pay attention to. 
because this is about meeting God's holy standard. It's not just saying I'm saved and that's it. Amen? Believers have the same challenge. It's not about just saying I'm saved and that's it. We have other responsibilities that we need to pay attention to. So verse 20 says, instead, we should write and tell them to abstain from eating food offered to idols, from sexual immorality, from eating the meat of strangled animals, and from consuming blood. Now, why is this important? It's setting a standard now for the Gentiles when it comes to how they treat things. Remember, the Gentiles were worshiping other idols. The Gentiles were taking animals and sacrificing them and eating from those animals because they were using it for idol worship. They weren't using it to, to do anything about asking for God's forgiveness. They were doing something that was totally inappropriate. The sexual immorality came because some of the idols they were worshiping condoned that behavior. And so what James is saying here is that he's giving us information that's helpful for us to see that now there is a standard that the Gentiles needs to meet, not circumcision, but by living right. Living in the right manner. That's what's being said here. That's what's being conveyed here. Living in the right manner. And I want you to go to Leviticus chapter 17. Uh, because that's going to address the last verse about, this is what was preached about a long time ago. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Back in the Old Testament. Levit Leviticus, I'll say that fast three times. Leviticus 17, verse 14. And understand that here's James again, going back to Scripture, reminding us of Scripture. It's Leviticus 17, verse 14. For the life of every creature is its blood. Its blood is its life. Therefore I have said to the people of Israel, you shall, nor, you shall not eat the blood of any creature, for the life of every creature is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. Now, we can eat meat. We can eat you know, the things that come from the Lord because those are things that are all provided by the Lord. But what were they told back in the Old Testament? If somebody, some animal is killed... Drain the blood. Drain the blood out and cook it. I mean, that's what we have to recognize here. There was a standard. And these Gentiles needed to come under the same standard that the Jews had. Because look what it says again in verse 21. For these laws of Moses have been preached in Jewish synagogues in every city, on every Sabbath for generations. There's a right way to act. There's a right way to do things. And that's what James was emphasizing with this statement. And we learn the right way to do things. You know, when we're growing up, let's face it, we were, we were growing up in households. Some of us may have been blessed to grow up in households where the Jesus was Lord. Uh, I was not. I did not have that privilege. I had to learn what was appropriate and what was proper. We all have to learn. We all have to, be, have to be taught things. And these Gentiles were being taught something now. If you really want to follow the Lord, if you really do have a relationship with Jesus, then there are certain things that you need to do to clean up your old practices. Don't do the stuff. That's why we're, we're made into new creations, right, everybody? Things of the old, we don't do that stuff anymore. We shouldn't be doing that stuff anymore. But the new things, as a new creation, that's what we need to be doing. And that's exactly what the Gentiles were, being, were going to be told. Because what we'll find out in our next lesson as we go through this is that they're going to be passing this information on by letter to all the churches, all the churches where there are Gentiles to read that you have a standard now that you need to follow as a believer in Jesus Christ. 
there should be a newness in our relationship with Jesus. Amen? You know what you used to do. I know what I used to do. I'll just put, I'll just put myself out there. I know what I used to do. And, you know, look, everybody knows what they used to do. We were all sinners. We all sinned. We all know that we were falling way short of God's glory. But if not for the blood of Christ, if not for his sacrifice on the cross, we're in serious trouble. I want you to go back to John chapter 3. And I, I just thought of this. I thought of it yesterday. But I want you to see something that's really important about recognizing that if we didn't declare Christ in our lives, we were in trouble. We were in serious trouble. John chapter 3, I want you to go down to, you already know what this chapter is. This is the one where Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. Just start with verse 16. John three sixteen. And we know this passage. But but I want to emphasize something too. It's very important within this passage. Please pay attention to this. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish. We need to emphasize should not perish, but have eternal life. We have eternal life because we believe in who? Jesus Christ. Believe in him for what he did on the cross for us. Amen. That's what we do. He's Lord and Savior. More than just saying, I know God. More than just saying, I know Jesus. Well, you need to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. In order that the world, notice how he says, not, did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Because we are rightfully under condemnation without Christ. But he came the first time around in order that the world might be saved through him. Look at verse 18. Remember, we've just got through reading 16 and 17. Look at verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Got that? But whoever does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, he does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. See what? His works have been carried out in God. That's supposed to be us. We are works of the living Christ. And people are to see the evidence of this because we know we're in a dark world. Amen? Do we not know we're in a dark world? We, we are in a dark world. This statement here, it's the gospel message, but we need to make sure that we're very clear about the importance of declaring Christ as Savior and Lord of our lives. Without that, we are already condemned. And that's the statement that when you make the statement and somebody says, what do you mean? I didn't stutter. The word says you're already condemned without Christ. You know, some people who play golf, you know, they... You know, you can't go back, go up to the Lord when you die and talk about, you know, can I take a mulligan, you know, for those who like golf, right? Or I, can, I get a, can I get a second chance? No, you don't get a second chance. You've had numerous chances before you died to declare Jesus is Lord of your life. And God makes it evident. So what does God say in his word? People are without excuse because he makes it very clear to everyone the importance of recognizing Jesus as Lord. Through what? The signs? We've had a solar eclipse this year, and we've seen the northern lights, 
not once, but several times if you were in the area. When is the last time you've ever seen that? Where you've seen all this, like never. That's right, never. What? How many different things do you need to see before you recognize that we have a Lord that is orchestrating all of the stuff that we see? And something as simple as nature, we have four seasons. All right, I'm done preaching. <laughs> but I want you to see how what James is doing in this passage is he's setting a standard for the Gentiles now. The Gentiles need to stop doing the pagan worship, the idol worship, the sexual immorality. Stop eating the meat of strangled animals. God set a standard for all this. The blood is life, and they were, they were not doing anything that was anywhere, anywhere near honoring the Lord. So James is making it clear, here's what we need to do. Let's tell the Gentiles this. We not, you don't have to worry about being circumcised, but you need to get your act together and do these things if you want to have true fellowship with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Simple request. And this is something that was amenable for everybody. What you're going to find is that the Judaizers said, okay, I get that. You guys did all these great things going out and preaching and teaching, but we still don't like what they're doing. Well, let's set a standard now. You can call that compromise, but it's not compromise on God's word. It's more about being obedient to God. God had intended for Gentiles to get the truth about Jesus Christ just like the Jews did. So the standard was being set and Gentile Christians had to now abstain from these crazy practices. I'm calling them crazy because that's what they were doing. And they really weren't following God. And this behavior is just not appropriate. Let's consider how important it is for us to follow the teachings that God gives to us when we read his word. Let's pay attention to them. Let's make them relevant in our own lives. Amen? Father, thank you for this time that you've given us to now go over your word and establish what's true and the truth that you would have us to follow. Lord, may we be lights in a world where people can see the evidence of Christ in our lives. Even when we go through difficulty, even when we go through tough times, may we still reflect the love of Christ to others who happen to see us. Lord, we recognize sometimes that the words that we say, even when we proclaim Christ, when times are good, may not get through to the other person, but they may, may they see Christ even in those times when we're struggling because they know we're relying upon you to help us get through those times. Lord, speak to those people who need to know the truth about Jesus. And we thank you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us for today's edition of Livestream Sunday School for Akron Alliance Fellowship Church in Akron, Ohio. Stay tuned online. We'll get together with you guys again here online uh, with our, on our Akron Alliance Fellowship Facebook page for a live church service. In the meantime, take care of yourselves and God bless you. And we'll see you around the corner. We'll see you next time.